Hey, good evening, guys. This is uh, Steve Kang, Pastor Steve. Just wanted to say thank you to Good TV USA for recording this interview. Uh, and I hope it uh, leads people to true repentance and salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Good TV USA. God bless everyone. Hey, guys. My name is Steve, and it's good to have you all. Uh, welcome to our office. Today, we are excited to sit down with Steve as he shares his miraculous testimony of surviving a drug-triggered psychosis that left him in a coma. Um, I grew up in Korea until the age of nine. So uh, I was born in Seoul. I remember living with my aunts, grandma, grandpa, like 10 of us sleeping in one room. So it was a very cozy community-based living. But at the same time, my parents were not around because they were overseas preparing for us to move over here to the United States. You know, from the age of six, I was attending the temples and I was very into it. Unlike some of the other kids who were just kind of coming by, I was actually asking questions to the monks. I was sleeping there, going there every weekend. As a matter of fact, I remember asking myself, why are human beings born? What is the purpose of humanity? What is the purpose of life? And because I was not exposed to Christianity back then, um, Buddhism was the only like venue of me finding the answers to my curiosity. Um, I came at the age of nine and at first everything was so good, right? Big supermarkets. You have to remember back in the 80s in Korea, there was no supermarkets of that size or even restaurants, never mind pizza, McDonald's. None of that was ever present in Korea back then. So I was so delighted by the holidays, the, the toys, the amount of food, but I had an identity crisis as I entered middle school and I asked my mom like why am I Korean American mom I want to be white living in Boston there's no Asian there's no Asians there guys this is like the countryside of Boston in the late 80s early 90s so we were like the minority of minorities there's no one you can really there's no role models that are Asian American around you everyone's Caucasian or you know Puerto Rican or African American back then so and that does create not just confusion but that confusion becomes anger and that anger responds through re rebellion and I think long-term you know, depression or sadness because anger is a sign of being sad or not having something you want, right? So I think there's a big relationship there. I don't want you guys to think I was doing drugs for a long term. I actually started doing drugs <laughs> during this, like the freshman year, we were just smoking weed once in a while. I ended up living with my friends who were, it was a dealer home. So we're having like, huge Jansport bags of drugs going in and out. We're transporting it, we're carrying it, we're selling it. We're smoking it three times a day. Now school reopens in the fall and I'm trying to readjust to life but I can't because I'm so drugged out. So another guy came and we smoked out again but this is where it gets kind of crazy but I smoke what's called a death bowl. A death bowl is the street name for heroin, cocaine, PCP. It looks like marijuana, but it's laced. So when I smoked this drug, I stayed up for 10 straight days. After the third day of staying up, you lose sight of date, time, who you are, why you're alive. On the last day, I actually had an encounter with, I believe it's Satan now, but he came to me in an open eye vision. He just looked like an Asian grandpa and said, I know you're having a hard time and I said yeah I thought it was my Buddhist God so when he came to me he said it's time for you to take your own life cut your neck cut your stomach and I'll spare you from hell and I didn't know Jesus back then so that's exactly what I did I went to the kitchen with my mom in the house and I grabbed the biggest knife I could find and I cut my neck open and also my stomach open you know which and I lost 90% of my blood my mom walks into the living room and she sees her son almost dying. She calls 911 and the cops come over to try to get the knife away from me. And they came in within like one minute, right? I was wrestling with them. They took the knife away. They maced me, whacked me with the bat and we're struggling. And that's when I fainted after being whacked, whacked, whacked by the bat. And pretty soon I'm going in and out and, and I'm in the hospital. And at the hospital, um, that's when I had the, the OBE. I literally, you know, lost consciousness before the surgery. And I see myself, but I'm not going to heaven like the false god Satan in coming as an old grandpa said. I'm sinking and it feels like an elevator just falling down. And after five minutes of just this horrific feeling of being abandoned and fear multiplied by a hundred by anything you can feel on earth, I land and I look around and it's hell. How do I know it's hell? Because 
first of all, I never had this thought before, but when I got there during this out of body experience, I look around and there was just so many countless people. I wasn't the only one there. Demons are ceiling high, they're everywhere. I feel pain and I knew I was a sinner and I will never leave this place. I don't know where the idea came from. I just supernaturally knew, instinctively knew. And that's when I realized like I made a big mistake. I woke up the next day and they told me I was out for 12 hours, but it was a five minute visit to hell. And I knew I didn't want to be there because it's like hopelessness, despair, loneliness, pain. When I came out of it, I was like, you know, in just very traumatized for the next three months. That's how painful it was. Jesus talks about a place of torment where there is no quenching of fire and there's no stopping of the gnashing of teeth. And I did feel heat, I did feel darkness, I felt hopelessness. That's how I knew it was biblically valid. It was exactly what he said. When I opened my eyes, I was surrounded by pastors like, you wanna see the sinner's prayer? I was like, yes I do. I was so relieved and scared of hell and relieved of being alive at the same time that I, I think I said the sinner's prayer about 10 times. Yeah, so the Lord allowed me in His grace and, and love and mercy to, to see hell, just like it is in the Bible. And then six months later, or, or rather more like seven months later, in the summer of 1999, um, I was in Korea now. Now for six months, yeah, I was just resting at, at the prayer mountain. I tried to go back to school, but I couldn't really be physically all there. So I ended up just kind of leaving school. I'm resting. I'm um, trying to become a Christian, right? But at the same time, I'm still partying with my, my, my non-Christian friends. Heard what happened, they still kept coming. So I, I still went drinking after this happened. I was like, Lord, I heard this mercy and forgiveness. Let me have one last shot, right? It ended up causing me to party like every day. But in the midst of this partying in the summer, the Lord allowed me to have a car accident, which really struck fear in me. And at the same time, he gave me a dream, like I didn't even ask for this dream. I was on the top of a mountain, the dream, very vivid. And I heard the voice of God and I've never heard audibly this clearly. And, and God speaks to me in Bible verses and he said, Jesus is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him, listen to him, listen to him. And I was like, oh my God, did I just hear God? And I saw this triangular light like rotating in the dream and, and I'm on the top of a mountain and I see this huge, beautiful valley with a river and mountains on both sides. And just like it says in Revelation 21, verse 2, it says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. It was literally a transparent pyramid, triangular city. Just, I think it was a new Jerusalem. And it came down and there were angels on both sides just flying with trumpets that were so long. Doo -doo -doo -doo, and they're worshiping God. And I knew it was not human voice because it was just so holy and perfect and majestic and beautiful. At that moment, compared to seeing hell <laughs> and compared to that hopelessness times a hundred which of anything on earth, painful, pain-wise, and seeing heaven where the peace and the joy and the comfort you feel of having Father right next to you, like tangibly, visibly with you, is incomparable. And I knew that God was showing me heaven to because He wants all of humanity there. He wants every single soul there. The defining moment for heaven and hell, seeing heaven and hell and coming to a point of realization and resolution of lifestyle change was I need to share this gospel with every human being I meet. We ask ourselves, like, what can we do to love this person, right? We can do acts of service, give them money, pray for them. But if they don't know Jesus, the greatest gift we can give them is to let them know these two places are real and that through Jesus, you can actually go to heaven only through Jesus actually, you know, and have a relationship with, with the Father where you're His child. You know, it's the most beautiful thing we can give somebody. I can with 100% confidence tell you right now that I do not struggle with depression or suicide ever, except when I am overworked and physically tired, but that, that's not depression or suicidal thoughts, right? What I, why am I saying this? Because I believe not taking care of the body is a big element of having a unsuccessful spiritual life. The degree to which you take care of your body and your spirit is the degree to which we can have uh, true joy and, and enjoy you know, life with Jesus. So I really believe in that, big proponent of that. If you're struggling through depression and sadness or lack of motivation, uh, we have to start by shifting the focus from ourselves to others. 
I don't know if you noticed this, but when you're with others, it's hard to be depressed. When you're with God, it's hard to be depressed. When you're more aware of other people suffering than your own, it's hard to be unmotivated because you've got to do stuff to help them. Jesus said in John 12, 24, I love this verse. It's actually my second favorite verse. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to ground and dies, it remains alone. It's not good for us to be alone. But if it falls to the ground and dies, then it bears much fruit. It will bear a huge harvest. So can we ignore it? It's not just about ignoring, but it's about shifting the focus from being aware of my depression to thank God that I'm even alive. But some people come to a point where professionally they might need psychiatric help. And I'm not against that because medicine too is a blessing from God, I believe. But there comes a point when you're healed to a certain degree. Now it's up to you and the Lord. So I start my day through prayer and thanksgiving and praise and it reshifts priority and joy, right? And in His presence, it says in the Bible, there's a fullness of joy. So our job is not to get rid of depression. Our job is to get into His presence and He will get rid of the depression for you. When I'm down, I have a Thanksgiving notebook and I will start writing what I'm thankful for. And then you, you're like, oh, when was I down, <laughs> right? So it's all about that reshifting of the focus and doing what we can do. When we are hopeless and when we're going through depression and suicidal thoughts, I want to encourage you guys that there's, it takes one word from Jesus. For me, it took one encounter to get rid of that junk. So have hope because God can literally change your situation from the prison to the palace in one day. For me, it was like literally hell to earth to heaven in one day. So God has a plan to use you and there is a purpose to your suffering. I didn't know this, but now I have so much compassion for suicidal people. So I wanna encourage you guys that Jesus has allowed the suffering to happen because number one, he wants to deliver you. And number two, he's gonna use that story for you to be able to relate to those who are gonna go through the same thing later. So you're in good hands. It's gonna be okay, says the Lord. It's gonna be okay. After the pandemic happened, the Lord's installing more fire, more anointing, more faith than when before the virus came. I, you know, people say, oh, now I'm not motivated to do stuff. You know, we've had daily prayer. Today's day 54 of our daily prayer chain. Every morning we've been praying. And what God, what we feel like God is saying to the body of Christ and to us who seek Him daily in the morning, first thing is, I want my church to wake up. I want my church to be a pure, spotless bride before I come back. So my heart burns for the church. When I meet a believer, my number one priority is how can I get this guy on fire? How can we be radical? Because if you're not crazy for Jesus, you'll be crazy for something else, like golf or something else. I don't know what, but every human being worships and is crazy for something, even if that's laziness or, you know, saving souls. So I feel like God is saying, be on fire, be hot. Don't let me spew you out of my mouth. Be like the five wise virgins who was ready for His coming. Because if you're not, if you miss it, it's too late. Live on fire for Jesus. And I'm not talking about just outwardly, on the inside. We can live on fire for Jesus. For the world, I feel like God is saying, anyone can meet Him. So my heart's burning for both the church and evangelism. And I feel like we have one shot at this, you know? Only one life, it will soon be passed. What's done for Christ will last. We're very excited to see, you know, God use everybody in the body. No more people on the sidelines. This is not time for the sideline Christianity. Everyone's in the game. Everyone's in the Colosseum. Everyone has to fight. I was once lonely, confused, and fatherless. But now, after meeting Jesus, heart to heart, person to person, I belong to a eternal family. I have a good, good, perfect father who will never leave me nor forsake me. I am found and made whole. I am one with myself. And I am probably the most grateful person ever alive for just breathing. I don't need anything. There's no more selfish goals. It's just being with Jesus is more than enough. And the person in front of you is number two in the sense that there's Jesus and then there's a person in front of you who is made in his image. So I would say I am very thankful, joyful, and fearless because of meeting Jesus now. We hope you were encouraged by this episode of Defining Moments. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share it with a friend. Also in the links below, you can stay connected with us on Facebook and Instagram as well. Hope to see you there. God bless.